12, we can start. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Yi Wang from Vanderbilt University, and she's going to talk about the Arverson Douglas conjecture and related geometric invariants. Yi, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to first thank uh, Javad and the other uh, organizer for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful meeting and uh, giving me this chance to talk. Um, so, and then I want to follow by an apology that. Uh, so most of the results I talk today are uh, mainly on the more analytic spaces like the Bergman space or the Hardy space. Uh, but uh, for the problem I talk about, there's uh, for most of the problems, there's also a version on the Arfson, uh, Julia Arfson space. Um, and uh, uh, some of the prob some of the versions are equivalent to the uh, version on the more analytic spaces. Uh, for some of the problem, uh, the uh, analytic like Bergman or Hardy space version are easier to work with. So uh, you can think of these as a, an easier version of those uh, analogs in in very often space. So let me start by introducing some background. So as the title says, um, uh, two things. So Arfson Douglas conjecture and uh, geometric invariance. So uh, in this talk, the emphasis will be more on the geometric invariance. So there will be two type of invariance I talk about today. So the first uh, is the relates to an extension, an element in the extension group, which gives you some k-homology uh, elements. And uh, another one is called the Halton Hall trace formula, which also gives you a geometric invariance. So uh, to begin with, let's uh, define the spaces. Uh, and I want to uh, thank Michael and uh, uh, JDEP for uh, introducing, giving a, a, a good introduction to the jury option space. So, and also the, uh, the universal property of it. So here I will just be lazy and introduce the spaces in the most uh, uh, easier way by, by the uh, expansions. So, uh, so there are three type of spaces we consider today. So the first is the uh, the main theme of this week, Dewey-Arfson space. So you, uh, you already know there's uh, multiple ways of defining it. So one way is to uh, think of uh, this as a poly, uh, like a series uh, uh, consisting of uh, like the linear combination of Z arcs and, and uh, uh, the CRs form an orthogonal basis with uh, this norm. And also there's the Hardy space uh, and the weighted Bergman space. So the hardest, uh, the easiest way to define is also by the orthogonal basis given by uh, those numbers here. And uh, the operators uh, of interest here is the tuple mz1 to mzn. So these are just a pointwise multiplication operators on those spaces. And uh, uh, JDAP has all, already talked about uh, these tuples. So you can see, you can prove that so these tuples are uh, the so-called contractions, meaning that uh, they themselves are commutative. And if you look at uh, this difference, they are uh, positive. And uh, um, since we have given the orthogonal basis here, so if you uh, compute like directly computation gives uh, the, the following relation. So if you look at like all on each of the three types of spaces, if you consider the commutator, cross commutator like MZI and MCJ star, then you can compute that so the commutator is the shorten p for any p greater than n. And so this phenomenon essentially leads to 
the definition, the setup of, of the um, uh, Everson Douglas conjecture. And uh, uh, invariance. So um, let me, so we will first talk about the uh, invariance on these three type of spaces uh, the Duraven space, the Hardy space. And uh, all the weighted Bergman spaces. And on all these uh, three types of spaces, you can define a so called topless algebra by just uh, taking the C step algebra generated by the multiplication operators and also the identity operator. Um, and because of the identity, uh, because of this relation here, uh, we know that. Uh, the operators themselves commute. And they, uh, if you take the adjoint, they commute up to a compact operator. So from that reason, you know that if we take this uh, C-star algebra generated by, by those, then if you take the quotient out, if you take the quotient over the compact uh, operators, then you will get a commutative C star algebra. And the commutative C star algebra is just a C of X. And in this, these particular cases, you can prove that the, C, the X here is actually just the unit sphere. And that gives, me, gives us an exact sequence like this. Um, here, the K to the topless algebra is given by the embedding and this one is by the quotient. So uh, given this uh, exact sequence, uh, the brown douglas Fillmore theory tells, me, tells us that uh, um, this is called an extension and all the extensions uh, with the K and C of 100 BN on the sides form a group. And this is called the extension group. And uh, uh, one can also prove that uh, using a duality, uh, this extension proof is isomorphic to uh, the K homology on the boundary. And uh, so, so this extension defines an element in the K homology, which uh, we can see it as a uh, geometric invariant about uh, the sphere. So that's one, one type of um, um, geometric invariant given by an extension. And uh, here's another type, which is uh, in, some size, in some sense more refined. Um, so let me first uh, do, uh, start by defining the toplet operators on the Hardy space and the weighted Bergman spaces. And uh, uh, previously, we defined the Hardy space and the weighted Bergman space using their orthogonal basis, but uh, uh, there's a more canonical way of defining it, um, which gives me that the Hardy space is a closed uh, Hil uh, Hilbert subspace of uh, the L2 space of the sphere with the surface mesh, usual surface mesh. And uh, uh, for, the jury, uh, for the weighted Bergman case, uh, you can embed, so uh, there's another definition for the weighted Bergman space, which is all the holomorphic functions that are square integrable with some measure. So this weighted measure here, So this weighted measure here is uh, uh, some normalized weighted measure, like defined like this. So, so dm is the big measure, and so this is a normalizing constant. So, so in both uh, these and uh, these, uh, these spaces are there's an uh, ambient L2 spaces that contains them.
And using this structure, one can define the toplets operators on those spaces. Uh, if you define the P to be just uh, the orthogonal projection from either the L2 of the sphere to um, the Hardy space, or L2 of uh, the lambda T to the weighted Bergman space, then you can uh, compress uh, pointwise multiplication on it. So for each of the L2, if you consider a bounded function, we call a symbol. If you consider a bounded function, then this MF, if pointwise multiplication defines a bounded operator, then you can simply uh, compress those operators on the corresponding Hardy space or the weighted Bergman spaces. And this is called uh, the topless operator with the uh, symbol uh, F. So in a paper uh, by Houghton and how they considered something like this. So they first defined the so-called anti-symmetric sum, uh, which is the following. So if I have A1 to AK, which are K-bounded uh, linear operators on Hilbert space, then you can consider this anti-symmetric sum to be just uh, this, uh, take uh, the anti-symmetrization over the product of those operators. And uh, in the case when k equals two, um, a1, a2 is just uh, the commutator itself. So it's a generalization of the commutator. And they are, they prove that if you consider for the Hardy space or the Bergman space, if you consider two uh, n uh, smooth symbols, then if you consider the toplet operators uh, with the two n symbols, and uh, you take uh, the anti-symmetric sum uh, of them, uh, this anti-symmetric sum will be in the trace class, so that you can consider the trace of it. And they prove that the following trace formula. So this uh, trace of this anti-symmetric sum uh, is uh, the integral over this differential form. And and I should mention that uh, uh, Cohn's has Lane Cohn's uh, has a paper um, like generalizing this idea. Uh, it's called uh, um, an an let us uh, what's the Okay, I forgot the name, but like it, it, it generalized the, the uh, Houghton House trace formula, and he defined some uh, uh, like under very wide setting, he defined uh, the so-called um, chain character, and uh, uh, this would also lead to some geometric invariants. So back into here, uh, if you look at uh, uh, this integral formula. If you take the use the Stokes formula, you see this is actually equal to uh, the integral on the sphere. So if you use the Stokes uh, formula, so so then we know that. Uh, or uh, whatever, whether we are on the Hardy space uh, or the weighted Bergman space, the trees actually only de de uh, is determined by the symbols on the uh, sphere. And then in comparison with uh, this exact sequence here, so you can consider in here, you can consider uh, something like this. So this epsilon will be not close. The, the, the algebra generated by the uh, shot, some appropriate Schatten class uh, and uh, the toplets operators. Uh, so epsilon is the algebra generated by the Schatten class operator and uh, the TF, 
where f is seen, uh, c infinity. So then you have this uh, sort of exact sequence. And uh, um, so I found an explanation in Houghton and House paper very useful in understanding the concept of invariant. So they said that uh, an invariant, roughly speaking, is uh, something that uh, uh, is in, doesn't change up to some perturbation or some unitary transform. So in this case, uh, if you look at the Houghton Hall phase formula, you see that this trace is invariant. Um, so this trace uh, is only dependent on uh, the image in the C infinity, which we think of as the, the symbol. And if you look at uh, the exact sequence here, uh, the K1 element is uh, defined by a duality uh, using the Friedel Holm index. So roughly speaking, if you have a um, Friedel Holm operator here, you would project into an invertible uh, symbol over here. And uh, uh, this exact sequence also tells you that uh, the uh, Friedel Holm index is uh, independent up to uh, like only depends on the symbol over there. So that's why we uh, like part of the reason why we call it uh, call both things an invariant. And uh, here's the first uh, thing we talk about involving the extension group here. So uh, in, in this example, we talk about uh, the uh, dual Alpson space, the uh, Hardy space and the weighted Bergman space. Uh, but if you think of the setting, all you need is the uh, uh, n-tuple of operators with certain commutativity. So, so the Afton Douglas conjecture generalized uh, this uh, idea in, in that sense. So let me start by defining submodules and quotient modules. Um, so if you uh, let H be either the dual Alphonse space or the Hardy space or the weighted Bergman spaces, uh, then um, you can think of, so these tuple MZ1 to MZN, you can think of it uh, as uh, like it induces a module structure like over the ring, the polynomial ring, uh, which essentially is a, a homomorphism from the polynomial ring to the bounded operators uh, on those spaces. So every polynomial is sent to uh, P of those, which is essentially just uh, the pointwise multiplication by, by the polynomial. And then we can define the submodule, which uh, I think Jada also mentioned. So the submodule is uh, just an invariant subspace. So it's a uh, sub Hilbert subspace, which is in either of those spaces. And uh, they are invariant under these uh, module actions, the MCIs. And once you have this structure, um, you see that if you restrict those module actions on this R space, then they are still commutative. Uh, so they define the, a commuting tuple like this. So you, it's this Ri are just a restriction of these MCIs on R. And uh, uh, like if you uh, think of it uh, like in the algebraic picture, so if you take the quotient, then the quotient will also inherit um, a module structure from it, but we are in Hilbert spaces. So the quotient is uh, uh, isomorphic to uh, the orthogonal complement. So here we define the push corresponding quotient module to be just uh, the orthogonal complement of uh, uh, this uh, submodule. And now you can also define the module structure by just uh, uh, compressing those MZIs on the quotient spaces. And now on, on these spaces, the operator tuple of interest will be uh, either R1 to Rn or S1 to Sn uh, instead of the MZIs. 
and then we can ask uh, sort of the same question. Uh, so before that, let me. Uh, so the sub modules and the portion modules of interest in in the Julia Offensive space in, in the um, Offensive and Douglas conjecture is is the following two type. So if you start with the polynomial ideal, and if you take the closure of the ideal either in the Julia Offensive space, the Hardy space, or the weighted Bergman spaces, because the ideal is uh, multiplic like invariant under the multiplication. So if you take the closure, they will still be invariant under the module action. So, so this closure Ri would be a submodule in that sense. And then you can define the portion module uh, by just uh, taking orthogonal complement. And uh, also uh, from a more geometric point of view, if you start with a complex variety, you can think of uh, this uh, RV just being the functions in, in the corresponding spaces that uh, vanish uh, on this variety. And I haven't mentioned here, but uh, those spaces are uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So the uh, evaluation point evaluation are bounded. So from this, you can prove that uh, these RVs are uh, sub modules as well, and you can define a portion modules as well. And uh, so with these examples, and with the property of uh, uh, the entire spaces in mind, this property, the commutativity, shorten commutativity. So then we are, it's natural to ask the following question. So um, if you start with the polynomial ideal, uh, then I consider this uh, submodule, which is the closure of uh, this polynomial ideal in either in either spaces, um, and there's the corresponding quotient module, uh, which is just uh, the orthogonal complement. And uh, we can ask the same question. So are the module actions uh, cross commutators of the module action uh, is uh, in Shelton class for some appropriate Shelton P class? And uh, it turns out so the appropriate p range would be for any p greater than the complex dimension of the zero variety. Um, and I should mention that this is the, the uh, one of the many versions of the Alfson Douglas conjecture. Um, and uh, uh, there are research for on, for example, the strong Bergman spaces on the strongly pseudo complex domains. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, there is a geometric version of the uh, uh, conjecture which uh, you deal with not this ideal, but not this sub module, but uh, uh, this kind of sub module coming from the varieties. And uh, there are many more generalizations. So, So uh, in a homogeneous case, so uh, so Arfson first raised this conjecture uh, in his study uh, with uh, multivariable operators theory, and uh, uh, like because of uh, the universal property of the Julia, uh, of the Julia Arfson space, uh, it is natural to ask this question. Uh, because when you ask this, uh, because when you ask this question, you're actually studying all uh, D, uh, N contractions. So, um, so this is the uh, original version of the Arthur's conjecture. Uh, he asks uh, if you start with a homogeneous ideal, and uh, they can do the same thing. Take the closure. Take the R I on the Julia Arfson space. So this is on the Julia Arfson space. Um, then he asks, uh, is the commute cross commutator of the uh, module action on the sub module uh, 
essentially a com commutative uh, module uh, Schatten P class, where P is greater than M, which is the total dimension. Uh, so several remarks. Uh, so you can see the difference here that uh, first uh, for the uh, version of the portion module, the range is uh, slightly lower, so it's for the any P greater than the complex dimension of the variety. But uh, for the submodule, we, we conjecture that uh, it's only bigger than the uh, total dimension. Um, and uh, one thing that's uh, well known is that uh, um, because of uh, the uh, entire space uh, is the so-called P essentially normal, um, the, this property for, if you only consider P, P greater than N, then this property for the submodule is equivalent to uh, the version for the quotient module. So it doesn't matter which uh, we consider if we only talk about uh, uh, with P greater than N. But if you go beyond that, then that's a different story. So this is uh, definitely stronger. Um, that's one thing. And also, so for the Offson conjecture, it's originally on the uh, Jury Offson space. But uh, uh, if you think of like, this is the homogeneous ideal, then it's split, like there's a gradient structure in the homogeneous ideal that you can just uh, split by the degrees, like IK would be the uh, polynomials of degree K in that uh, uh, ideal. Then if you think of uh, uh, like the degree of the space, you can map it. So there's an isometry from the Jurafson space to, for example, the Hardy space or uh, or an isometry to the uh, Bergman spaces, for example. And this isometry is given by some uh, some polynomial. So maybe let me write it. So some polynomial of the uh, radio derivative operators. So, so like which sends uh, Z alpha to some constant multiple of Z alpha. Um, and uh, uh, so with this isometry and this uh, ideal uh, is mapped to the same ideal in here uh, with like if I is uh, homogeneous and this isometry would uh, keep preserve the gradient structure, like if you consider the uh, polynomials of degree k inside it, it's mapped to uh, polynomials of degree k in here. So with this uh, structure, like uh, gradient structure, you can prove that uh, uh, for homogeneous uh, ideals and for p greater than n, it doesn't matter which spaces uh, you are working on, they are all equivalent. So uh, so that uh, brings about some convenience. We can uh, take advantage of the analytic structure and get some results on the dewey Austin space. And also I should mention that uh, uh, there are also many imp uh, important results on the so-called quasi-homogeneous ideals, which is uh, when you consider the uh, weighted version of the degree. And uh, some results. So um, one can generally categorize known results into uh, three categories. Uh, the first is the about principles of modules. So uh, these, so let me first apologize that uh, I can only list uh, like part of the results. So this is not a complete list of the uh, results. And uh, uh, I know there are also uh, results on, for example, the uh, polydicks and uh, 
other important uh, domains, so which I uh, completely uh, ignored. Um, okay, so for the principal submodules, uh, typically you consider uh, polynomials I, uh, which is generated by a single polynomial of, or a single function. And uh, uh, for this, we can prove the essential normality pretty conveniently. And uh, I don't want to involve the techno technical details here, but uh, the idea is uh, you can reduce the commutator, um, like or you can reduce the argument on the commute cross commutator on the sub module or the quotient module into uh, the discussion of uh, uh, the commutator of uh, the multiplication operator on the entire space and the projection operators. And if you look at uh, this commutator, uh, you can, because of the invariance, you can write it this way. So it's like starting with the, uh, the quotient, the, the sub module, and you apply an MCI star and uh, you estimate how much it lies on on the quotient module. So it then it amounts to estimate, finding a good estimate of the MCI uh, of uh, the function in the submodule, in the submodule R. So finding a good estimate of this function uh, in the, in the submodule. And uh, in all the above, so they are approved in different ways, but uh, in all the above, the main idea is to estimate uh, the norm difference of this norm and proving that this difference is the uh, uh, control, the norm of this difference is controlled by some uh, bounded, uh, like compact operator. And uh, the second type involved the uh, involves something uh, more geometric, which is uh, smooth varieties. So there's the work by Angles and Ashmar and uh, uh, Douglas and Tan and Yu, and uh, also Kennedy and Sharif and myself and Douglas. So uh, it involves, so it involves a geometric version, which uh, uh, like uh, involves the submodule RV, which we in, uh, introduced before. So those are all the analytic functions that vanish on this variety. And uh, uh, typically, one would uh, assume that uh, this uh, complex variety have nice for uh, properties like uh, like this. So the variety V look like this. So it should be smooth on the boundary and it should intersect the boundary transversely, meaning that it cannot go uh, in this way, like in the tangent direction, but it has to go in this direction. Um, and also there's another type uh, which involves the uh, uh, division. So, so these are like, a, these smooth variety case and the principal case are, you can think of them as a building block of uh, the diffusion case. So the idea is you got a, a submodule or quotient module, you can, you want to define the, uh, divide them into nice sums of uh, these previous types. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about uh, uh, the so-called uh, stable diffusion property uh, introduced by Charlotte. Uh, uh, so he introduced this property which says uh, if, um, uh, so this ideal in a polynomial ring is to have the stable diffusion property uh, if there's a set of generator in the ideal. And uh, for any function in the ideal, I can have uh, a nice decomposition in terms of these generators. And for these nice decompositions, there's the norm control for each of the parts. So uh, roughly speaking, this means uh, the ideal 
if you think of the closure of the ideal, it's the uh, when you consider the sum here, oh, not direct sum like this. Uh, this sum is closed. So uh, with this prop, uh, so he proved the. Uh, so there are many ways to uh, prove that uh, uh, an ideal with this kind of property would uh, uh, give essential normality. And I also want to mention the connection with the several complex variables. So let me move to the previous slides. So in this case, if you look at uh, the proof of these results, uh, they are more or less like uh, proved in very different ways. Uh, but uh, one thing is very important uh, is the so-called extension theorem, uh, which appears in, in this, this, and this. Uh, basically, it uh, says that I want a extension from the variety holomorphic functions to the variety to holomorphic functions of the unit ball with some norm estimate. And once we have this, uh, one almost have the result. And this relates to several complex variables. Uh, there's a question in, in several complex variables called the L2 extension, which is exactly this. And uh, corresponding to the deficientness actually also a version on the several complex variables, which uh, is usually under the name of L2 deficient theorem. So here is the special version, which, uh, so here it considers uh, the ideal uh, of polynomials, uh, of functions that uh, vanish on, on just uh, the origin. And it says that every function um, vanishing <clears throat> at the origin of a certain order can be decomposed in a certain way, some norm estimates like this. Uh, but so the norm here is different than what we uh, wanted. Okay, so another thing that's uh, worth mentioning is this. So uh, in the original Arthurson Douglas conjecture, uh, uh, we have, uh, we conjectured that uh, the uh, module actions, the cross product are in short term P for uh, any P greater than N. And also for the entire space, for example, the uh, Dewey Arthurson space, by direct computation, you have. Uh, uh, MZI, MZJ stars, commute modular short term P for any P greater than N. So here is an example that uh, this N actually would, the, this lower bound actually changes if you change the domain. So that's a new phenomenon uh, we haven't seen before. So. Uh, so there's a paper by um, Tang Xiang and uh, his uh, former student, uh, uh, Jabri Mohammed. Uh, they studied this so-called egg domain. It's defined by like for, if you would fix the uh, n numbers, p1 to pn, positive numbers, you can define this uh, domain by this relation. And uh, you can prove that. So, so let me draw this picture. So if you have like pj's uh, next, uh, less than one, so you sort of get a domain like star shape, so not so good. Uh, if pj are equal to one, then that's just the circle. But if you take pj like greater than one, and as pj like tends to infinity, as it grows bigger and bigger, so for this, bigger uh, PJs, your domain sort of becomes this uh, uh, rectangular shape, more and more rectangular shaped. And as PJ tends to infinity, this domain 
sort of tend to the poly disk. And on the poly disk, uh, there's a version of the essential. So we know that uh, the corresponding, uh, for example, Hardy space or the Julia Option space do not have this property. So they don't have, they don't commute module some compact operator. So, so this egg domain as a P between one and infinity is a nice P in between the disk and the poly disk. And actually uh, by direct computation, you can see that uh, for the egg domain, you get uh, some P essential normality, which is in between. So you can see this lower bound of this P actually uh, grows as P uh, grows. So it, it tends to infinity as PJ would tend to infinity. So that's an interesting phenomenon. Um, okay, so next topic is the uh, Helton Hall trace formula, which is another uh, geometric invariant. So as we introduced uh, before, so the uh, on the Hardy space or the or the weight or the Bergman space, uh, the Houghton and how prove the following results. So if you uh, consider the toplets operators with uh, smooth symbols, uh, then you can prove that uh, this anti-symmetric sum is in trace class and you have this trace formula. And uh, also uh, here's a remark. So basically, uh, says that uh, this trace class membership is uh, highly non-trivial. So if you look at the definition, this uh, uh, commutate, this anti-symmetric sum, you can uh, write it as a, a sum of uh, usual commutators. So there will be uh, n of them in total. And for each of the uh, or commutator, you can only have they belong to Shelton P or P greater than N. So in this field altogether, you only have uh, the membership of uh, being in Shelton P for P greater than one. So you cannot reach one. So it, to prove this uh, is in the trace class, it actually needs to involve some simple calculus. So uh, which is highly non-trivial. So in the Houghton and House paper, they uh, prove the use a very uh, advanced uh, tool uh, developed by Hao is in his uh, paper, uh, Quantum Mechanics and uh, uh, Operator Theory. So he defined the symbol calculus and on the Hardy space, you can also use the, the symbol calculus defined uh, uh, developed by Butai de Monzo to reach the, get to this result. So, uh, so some partial results are we obtained on the quotient module and the sub module. So one is the following. So if you look at, uh, uh, as we previously mentioned, if you look at uh, uh, the RV sub module, which is induced by uh, a variety and the variety is uh, uh, smooth on the boundary and the transfers with the boundary, uh, then you have the following. So you can prove that for any p, any m greater than the dimension, uh, then this uh, anti-symmetric sum is in trace class, but with zero trace. Uh, but of course, if uh, the most interesting case would be QF1. QF2 to uh, QF2D, where D is exactly the dimension uh, of uh, the variety, uh, but this will be uh, very difficult to, to work with. So I imagine you have to develop some simple calculus over uh, the quotient module in order to achieve that. And, uh, and uh, in the case of the submodule, there's uh, some, uh, the case, uh, the situation is uh, a bit different. So we proved uh, that uh, uh, under the same setting, the smooth variety setting, uh, uh, if you consider um, the anti-symmetric sum of two n, uh, n toplets operators on the submodule, 
then you have this exact same uh, trace formula as the entire module. So um, here is some recent results. So uh, if you, so this is a joint result with uh, the Chao Zhen, Tang Xiang, and myself. So uh, in the previous, we considered the, the Hardy space and the Bergman space for the Houghton Hall trace formula. And also there's a, a weighted Bergman space and you can ask the same question. And we prove that uh, uh, the same thing holds for all the weighted Bergman spaces. And uh, the most surprising thing is that if you consider the trace of it, it will be actually invariant of the weight dt. So the uh, so the geometric invariant defined by this formula is in, uh, does not depend on the uh, any uh, weighted space. So whether you are working on the weighted Bergman space or the Hardy space, it doesn't matter. You got the same thing. Um, and if you think of it, oh, so so here's a generalization we gave. So uh, if you look at uh, the anti-symmetric sum, um, you can show that, uh, uh, so this is one way is like defining this by just the anti-symmetric sum of the toplitz operators. Uh, another way is to take anti-symmetric sum uh, over uh, semi commutators So here's the semi commutators And uh, so we prove that if you just uh, take anti-symmetrization uh, on the odd position or on the even position, uh, then they are also in the trace class. And the trace formula look a bit weird. So we don't have the trace formula for uh, every t, but if you consider the limit, then the, uh, the limit of these traces tends to uh, this integral. So it's a holomorphic in the uh, differential on the odd position and uh, the anti-holomorphic differential on the uh, even position. And in fact, if you are at uh, dimension one, uh, you can actually like this odd and even anti-symmetrization just to reduce to the usual partial uh, semi commutators And you can actually explicitly compute the trace. And uh, you can see there's a tail here. So we know for the uh, uh, semi commutator this, uh, uh, this trace actually depends on T. But if you take the full comment, for anti-symmetric sum, this tail would just vanish. Okay, so I have two minutes to talk about the dual absence space. So uh, for the uh, one difficulty of the generalizing the houghton Hall uh, trace formula on the dual absence space um, is the following. So the uh, one, the most important thing is you don't have uh, the general definition of toplitz operators on the Julian Option space. Uh, so one way you can consider is to just uh, restrict your uh, discussion to uh, a smaller class of symbols. For example, you can consider um, operators like this. Uh, so I should write M, where F and G are in the multiplier uh, of the dual option space. Um, I guess you need to restrict to nicer multipliers, which are, for example, holomorphic uh, in the uh, closure of the ball. And uh, you can take, uh, think of this as the topless operator of FRG. And uh, uh, it's, uh, so it is uh, very um, attempting to, uh, to uh, believe that if you consider topless operators like this, uh, you would have uh, the same kind of trace class membership and uh, trace formula. 
So uh, that's one possibility. And also, okay, so there's another way we uh, thought about uh, of like generalizing the concept of toplet operators on three opposite states. Uh, but I think I'm out of time, so I'll just stop here. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank the speaker first. Any question or comments for you? Well, if there is no question, let's thank her again. Thank you. This 